around about six billion dollars. You know, were it not for the energy crisis, we'd be growing very rapidly. Now, we could have taken the money and put it in our bank account and we'd have been no different than any other company. But we chose in these really hard times to support our customers. I grew up in a very low income family and, and we couldn't always afford our energy and, and, and that's incredible hard working single mom. And, and what really matters is what you think of yourself. As long as you can always tell yourself you did your best and what you did was right, you know, you've got a good chance of looking after yourself. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook Podcast, where we share inspiring startup stories with practical takeaways for you, the listener. Today's guest is very special, and I think it's one of my favorite guests of all time. It's Greg Jackson, the founder of Octopus Energy, which is now worth around $5 billion. Greg is a serial entrepreneur, and he started with a mirror making company, he's run coffee shops, but his now focus is this huge giant of a company with over 3,000 employees, but amazingly, no HR department. As you can already tell, he's got a very different approach to business than what you might read in the textbooks. And it's working very well for him and his customers love him. Let's get on to the show. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook, Greg. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I actually wrote an article about you a year ago because Octopus Energy, being a billion dollar company without a HR department, is just so unusual that is obviously very noteworthy. But that's not where you started at all. Right? You've been doing this for many years. What actually made you become an entrepreneur right at the very beginning? When I was at school, I found it really constraining. I could do the work, but I didn't enjoy being told what to do. I didn't enjoy the environment of it. And so I think um, uh, almost I started at that point deciding my own path in life. Um, so for example, you know, Instead of revising my exams, I, I wrote video games and, and learned to write software. And I left school when I was 16 to do that. And whether I was being an entrepreneur or not, I think that that was the bit when you were saying, hey, look, I think I've got a load to contribute, a load to offer, but I don't like being told what to do. I think that was naturally a good starting point. Well, actually, someone else that's good writing video games, we did try and sell them. We weren't massively successful, but, you know, there was a bit of that. And then uh, the first kind of real serious entrepreneurialism was, I think, when I graduated, I eventually stopped writing video games, went to university, uh, um, and then worked in a large company, Procter & Gamble. I went to Procter & Gamble already knowing that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but really wanting to learn about business. And I've got to say, I now feel quite selfish saying that because, you know, um, Procter & Gamble is an amazing organization. And I think it is quite entitled to people, like me in that case, to saying, I'm going there in order to learn some stuff so I can go elsewhere. Um, and, and actually, I became quite addicted to it. And I'd been there about four years. And I realized if I wasn't careful, I was going to become institutionalized. And uh, there was a, a couple of former McKinsey consultants who just, had just bought their first business after leaving McKinsey. And they needed someone to run it. And um, so I joined them. It was manufacturing mirrors, selling them to furniture retailers, big and small. Uh, and so, you know, age 27, uh, I was, took over this business that had I know, about 70 staff. Uh, we had a factory um, and uh, we had about half a million pounds of overdraft and about half a million pounds of overdraft limit. And every month was really all about managing cash so we could get to wages day with enough in the bank to pay the wages. That was the kind of, when I started, that was the kind of mission. Yeah. And going from working for Procter & Gamble to then managing that business, how did you feel about that? Because I imagine that would be really intimidating. I loved it. It was like a breath of fresh air. Like in a lot of large corporations, there is a department for everything. So, you know, if you wanted to book travel, you had to go through the travel booking department. And by the way, you know, if you're flying from London to Brussels, the flight is so short, they barely have time to serve any coffee before they have to take the cup off you. But you were forced to fly business class. And I'm quite sure I didn't need a lot of leg room. So I was kind of thinking, you know, the business class flight might be 500 pounds and I'd be able to go on EasyJet for 40. But Procter & Gamble wouldn't let you because they had a system and a department and a procurement contract and all that stuff. And so the moment I was out of that world, and I, I, I remember so well having to go to a meeting, I think in Brussels, in, in, the, in the manufacturing business, 
as an entrepreneur and I booked a 40 quid return flight and I felt freedom. I felt freedom to do what I thought was efficient and right. And it was so enjoyable. And, and, and I think that's, that, that kind of summed up how everything was. It was like the first time I went to see a customer in our, in our business. Um, and I didn't have to agree anything with anyone in advance. I didn't have to get anything signed off by a boss. And when I was with the customer, we could have a proper conversation. And I could go back and deliver the products that I said we were going to do. It was wonderful. And you said at the beginning, it was just about paying wages. How did you then make it thrive? So you weren't just worried about the cost. You're actually building the business and making it go further. It was incredible, actually. What, what happened was, um, so the, the, the people who bought the business, great guys, they'd bought it from a large corporate who were basically selling off all of their peripheral businesses. And so, um, yeah, it really had been neglected. And, and, and that was why it was in this kind of very hand-to-mouth state. Uh, there was a large retailer in the UK called Argos. And Argos was seen as bargain basement. Now, we had big, well-known retailers, the biggest department stores, all that stuff. And a lot of the effort had always been put into the big, well-known department stores. But you had this bargain basement retailer, Argos. And the way Argos sold its products back then was it didn't even bother putting them on the shelves. It had a warehouse at the back of the shop. And you went into the shop and there was a catalog. And you could choose what you wanted from the catalog. And then they'd bring it from the, from the warehouse at the back and serve you. Now, what that meant was that in Argos, what really mattered was how good does your product look in a photograph? And what we realized was the photographs of a mirror, right, in a catalog, they're about this big. And the only bit that's different between one mirror and another is the frame, which is about that big. And so you had all these mirrors shown in Argos, but you couldn't see the bit that mattered, which was the frame. So what... Um, uh, what I did was have a mirror design where the frame was really, really wide. So in the photograph, you could still see the detail. And it sold like hotcakes. And what we found was actually this kind of, what everyone else had seen as a bargain basement retailer was actually fantastic because once we'd unlocked the key to what would work for them, there was super high volume. Actually, their quality control standards were better than, because they were high volume, they cared about quality more than a lot of department stores. Their margins were lower. They, they made a lower margin, which meant that our customers got a better deal. So we gave our customers a better product, super high volumes, and ultimately, uh, that was great for our business. In fact, the volumes were so big, we were able to open new manufacturing facilities um, and really drive the cost down. And that delivered this win-win that turned the business around. Yeah. And it's one of those things where I think so many entrepreneurs right now, they don't look for those little tiny things that can make a huge difference. They're always focused on what everybody else is doing, what's going on there. But you just had that insight of how are they selling this? How are people looking at it? And a bit of psychology, right? Yeah, in fact, let me, yeah, I can give you a little bit more background because it was, it was a really important moment, uh, which was our gossip our company had previously had, I think, six different products in the Argos catalog, and it shrunk down to two. You know, we were hanging on to Argos by a, by a thread, and Argos went through a six-monthly process of reviewing their range. And, uh, you know, the, the former owners had said, look, if we lose Argos, it doesn't really matter. We've got to really focus on the high-end department stores where we can do you know, really uh, exclusive premium design products. But actually, it was flipped that on its head. And look, we got something in the catalog that was so much better. Because the problem with the, the department stores is there may have been high value premium products, but the department stores sold most of that in a huge margin. Um, the volumes were tiny. And if it didn't sell, they'd send it back. So it was very risky for us. And then because their volumes were lumpy, because they were quite low, it tied up loads of cash. Whereas with Argos, we could keep it flooding through the factory. You know, it's wonderful. Yeah. And you did other businesses after as well on the way to Octopus Energy. Which ones were like some of the ones that you think you learned the most from? Yeah. So I think uh, after, uh, after that one, we um, used the fact that it turned around to uh, get some investors and then sell the business to a company we acquired. And that let, let me become a proper entrepreneur, really opening up new businesses and increasing heading in a direction that I was excited by. Um, but there was one business that I acquired with a business partner who um, I didn't know as well as I should have done and turned out, you know, to have some things in his background, his past that were really problematic. 
And ultimately, that led to us having to go our separate ways and, and close the business down. And what I learned from that that's stayed with me for the last 20 years was the importance of trust. And so uh, everything I've done in business since then has been with people where I've known them for decades and where you know there's just total trust and integrity. Uh, so as individuals, they ooze integrity. And um, I trust their intentions and their behavior so much. And I think that has been critical, actually. But what that lets you do when you've got super high trust is build incredible teams. Because uh, you know when you're at school doing chemistry, there are experiments where what you do is you'd, you'd have a, a solution, you'd drop a crystal in it, and then the whole thing would, would, would crystallize. And all of the crystals would reflect the initial crystal. There'd all be replicas of it. And I think in the same way, what we found is when you start a business with people with super high integrity, incredible trust, as we grow, so it replicates that. And, you know, loads of work has been done on teams and trust. And I think trust is not just about they're not going to nick money. One would hope very few people will do that. But it's really about do they have the best intentions of their colleagues, of the company, and of their customers at heart? Or are they, for example, willing to step on others to get to the top? And, and look, I'm not going to judge different ways of, of behaving in companies. But what I have enjoyed is working in companies where largely the trust and love for one's colleagues vastly outweighs politics. And that's been incredible. I think it comes back to as well when you mentioned about P&G, Procter & Gamble, when you started off. And you went there with the intention for learning them moving on. And I think it's one of these different situations a lot of people face now, where do I work for a corporate and learn? And, but then, like I said, a lot of people in those bigger companies are sometimes working for their own intentions. And you get this other people who are, they really love the team environment and they're really working for that team. Whereas when it's a startup or a smaller business that's growing, that's where it's so important to have that trust. Because if somebody joins a company that's only got 10 people and they're just there because, oh, we want to learn for a bit, then go off again. That's such a big effect on everything, right? Because in a corporate, it might be mitigated a bit more. There's more people to fall back on. But especially, I think, when you're growing a startup, each person is so important at the beginning because, like you said, it's then replicated. If somebody's in their first 10 employees, they set the tone for everybody else. It's exactly that. Like, that replication is real. Um, I think it's why you'll often find that smaller businesses enjoy very long tenures of their team. Like, people join and they don't leave. Because you work really hard to look after the people and give them what they want in their job because losing them is so painful. And I think one of the things when you look at corporates, and, and, and by the way, this isn't to criticize them at all. They, you know, they're, they're the machines that have built most of our society. Um, but if we, if we look at the, the, some of the downsides, one of them is often there'll be people have lost personal responsibility for the product or the customer um, of delivering the company's outcomes. And instead, they spend 90% of their time writing PowerPoints and dealing with internal issues. And I think, you know, the more we see people dealing with internal issues rather than actually driving the machine forward, the, the more opportunity to say, look, if we can release that internal time and focus on growing the business, imagine how fast we can grow, how much better we can do for our customers, what more we can innovate and develop for society. And so I think actually... It's really interesting that all these philosophies that I think entrepreneurs and small businesses think about that often get lost when translated to corporates, and yet corporates could benefit so much from them. Yeah, and it's in Oxford's energy, you're obviously doing a lot of things to try to keep that mentality, even if you're scaling massively. But to bring it back for the audience who maybe don't know why you went from mirrors to energy, can you dive into that story? Like what made you start Octopus Energy? What's the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I was, I was an entrepreneur because I, I, I kind of have a sense that I've got a lot to offer, a lot to contribute, and I enjoy doing stuff. I don't enjoy being told what to do. That's what made me an entrepreneur. And it almost meant that whatever I ended up doing was going to be something entrepreneurial. And I think, you know, rather than sitting on a stool and, and thinking about what would be the perfect business to start, one of the key things entrepreneurs is getting going, right? Like, you can set off on a path, you can change course over time, you can direct it. But the key really is saying, like, you know, you're going to keep moving and driving in a direction. 
Um, so it doesn't really matter that I started with mirrors. That, that enabled me to build yeah, an asset and some experience and get to know people that I could then use to build to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. I know it's really naff, but I've got this phrase that I use quite a lot, which is you've got to be in it to win it. So, you know, if you want to, if you want a business in a sector, get started. You can make it perfect later. But, you know, all the time you're on the outside, you don't really know what the problems are. You don't know what the opportunities are. Uh, you don't know all the people. But as soon as you've launched something, you're meeting people. Now, if you start a business in mirrors, you're still getting to meet banks and accountants and learn how to sell and learn how to manage. Uh, some of my greatest management lessons came from that mirror business. And we can talk about those later if you want. But, you know, ultimately, I, I did want to do something that changed the world. And there are a few things that I know about and care about. So I always knew about tech. Um, I started off writing video games when I was younger. And, you know, I can write machine code still. Uh, I'm not so good on modern tech, but anyway. Uh, but so I always thought tech has the opportunity to do a lot to improve the world because it makes it more efficient. It creates better services. Ultimately, I think it will help us tackle climate change and so on. So I was always going to do something with tech. And then I care about, um, I joined Greenpeace when I was 16, right? I grew up in a very low-income family and, and we couldn't always afford our energy. And, and, and um, I had this incredible, hard-working single mom. But, you know, um, that... That tells you how important it is to families to drive down costs of fundamentals like energy. So you've got tech and you've got energy, you've got the environment. Uh, and, and, and I think for me, therefore, I was lucky that through a series of businesses, I got to the point where I had both the connections and the credibility and the assets to be able to move into energy, which is, you know, look, um, the people who started Uber weren't cab drivers. The people that started, you know, Airbnb weren't hoteliers. You don't disrupt a sector by being of that sector. You disrupt it by bringing tech and fresh insight. And that's what we were able to do here. I like what you said there as well about when you grow up with a single mum as well, then so many people, entrepreneurs, they always say, oh, you hear these stories and you think, oh, you have to have a certain background to be successful. And I just don't think that's true at all, right? There's, you could have decided when you're younger, oh, I don't have a chance because of these reasons, because of these things holding me back. But you didn't do that. And now, look what you've achieved now so a very good entrepreneurial friend of mine actually started a very successful business you know he was a palestinian refugee that lived in the east end of london in a council estate and he and i were talking about this once and he said look um thing is greg you and i are not scared of having nothing because we've been there and i think that is really important so there are some people who of course look if, if you've got family money it might make it easier to invest in something but at the same time, you may not actually know what it is like to have nothing. And therefore, you're scared of taking the risks that might lead to that. And I think, you know, for me, I've always known that if everything went wrong, I'll be okay. And I don't know whether everyone knows that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's true. And it's something which is for myself, right? That for me, I'd say it's my dad who he came to this country when he was younger. He's the one who had the hard, much harder time than I did. And he set me up in a way that I can now use that base. And I always remember that he's the one that did the hard work, really. Anything I achieve is because of what he did in the first place. And taking on energy, because no matter where you are in the world, people know that like, utility companies like energy, usually like oligopoly is very hard to break into. But you gain customers at a very rapid rate. And can you share some insight into how you were able to do that? First of all, energy is critical. Absolutely, everyone has to have it. Um, and it's a high-ticket item. You know, a typical energy bill in the UK before the energy crisis was about £1,000. That's $1,500 a year. Um, in the energy crisis, it's double that. And so um, it is a truly massive sector. So when people say to me, look, in energy, you've got these you know, very low margins. Actually, if we're entrepreneurs and we think of it as an ARPU instead, you know, look, if we've got a 2% margin on a $3,000 a year ticket, that's a $60 ARPU. And everyone has to buy the product. This is pretty, you know, it's a pretty appealing market. And, and so I think for us, what we wanted to do was take a view that um, we wanted to build uh, a long-term sticky customer base who loved us. And the traditional approach in energy is that um, in competitive markets, which dominate in Europe and, and in the US is only really in Texas, a little bit in the Northeast. But um, uh, they dominate in Australasia and there's two. Uh, but where um, 
it, it, where customers have choice, most energy companies charge them um, on a two or three hundred dollars below cost in year one to win the customer. And then as soon as the customer's not looking, they hike that to five hundred dollars above cost. Now the average margin there is small, but what they're doing really is they're teasing a load of customers onto the book and then hoping some of them stay in a world of super normal margin afterwards. And as a customer, that's a shit experience, right? You either have to go hunting for a bargain every year right, and trust that somehow that bargain is going to manifest because you don't know how much energy you're going to use. You don't know whether they're really going to be true to their word, whether they've got any tricks up their sleeves. Um, so you've got to go bargain hunting every year or get truly ripped off. Both are terrible outcomes. And instead, what we did, we just had to say, look, what you want is a company you can trust that will give long-term good value. Now, it takes discipline from us because we know we could hike our prices without everyone noticing and, and make higher margins. But in the long run, that would erode trust. And so we're a business that set out to build trust. And what that means is we have to be unbelievably disciplined in delivering what we say. It's the same with our service level. So we built our own technology platform, Kraken, that um, drives down our operating costs, increases service. And, and by the way, look, we, we can operate with about 75% fewer people than a rival company, but deliver better service because of the tech. But then the discipline is to share the savings of that back with customers and to use the tech to drive transparency so we get this long-term value growth. And, and, and as a result, we now have uh, you know over 3 million household customers in the UK that have chosen us and, uh, you know, during the energy crisis, every energy company has been, um, you know, we, they've all stopped marketing because customers are currently very loss making. But we have customers knocking on our door wanting to be with us because we've built and delivered, relentlessly delivered this proposition. That's what this incredible team do. I think what you mentioned there before about Uber and Airbnb, because what they brought is that tech side of things to a business which was very like people rested on their laurels in a way, right? They were doing the same things over and over again. And I think I saw it, you mentioned it recently about how energy was ripe for tech disruption. And it's, if you can make it much more efficient, then you're operating with lower margins, which means that, well, you're operating with them lower costs, which makes everything easier. Whereas obviously I've had experiences at other energy companies in the past through my past work from people I know who's worked from them. And you often just hear the, the horror stories of, employees there who hate working there because of the way they're treated and the way that they kind of know they're not being quite honest with their customers and it puts them in a, in a difficult position right it does i think yeah no i really think that's true I and mean, the a lot of companies have got great people working for the company and they believe that the company is on a good mission on the whole but the world is set against it and therefore they're forced to do some things that and not consistent with their values. And it's really hard. And, and, you, and you've got really good, decent people working hard, but they're trying to square away that, that inconsistency. And again, I think one thing that entrepreneurs can do is it's really hard to change a company once it's large. Right? So you know, for the people that are running those big companies, their challenge may be saying, hey, look, we, we wanted to provide better service for customers, better value, and environmental improvement. But where we are today is we're selling products that are terrible for the environment. Uh, we, we have to charge higher prices because our systems are out of date and our um, uh, overheads are so high. And we have to provide poor service because we just haven't got the money to invest to change this. In the long run, I hope it will change. That's the kind of mentality of a large enterprise. The opportunity of an entrepreneur is we have to get in there and even though we know we could charge higher margins and we could pay our staff less and we could deceive customers, we could do we have to use our discipline to stay true to our promise so that as we scale, we become a bigger version of what people want, not a new version of what already exists. I just love that mentality so much. And one of the things you made headlines for across the world is having built such a big company about a HR department. Because we were talking before about how when you've got 10 employees, you don't need an HR department. But everyone thinks when you get to like 50 employees, 100 employees, my old company had 25 employees. They had a HR person. And how did that come about? Was that from your mirror background? I think you mentioned there where you had, you learned a lot about management there and you've always enjoyed the people side of things. 
But how did you scale that? Because most people listening would be like, that's impossible. So prove them wrong. So it's not that I hate HR departments or anything, by the way. There's some great HR directors and HR professionals. And a traditional company may well need one because its managers, its culture, don't allow it to operate without one. But, you know, we've been able to grow it from scratch. And the insight really was, yeah, look, when you're a 10-person company, you as the manager, the owner, the entrepreneur, don't have an HR department. And if something happens, you need to work out how to deal with it. Now, you may make a mistake, but that mistake is rarely going to kill the company, and you will learn from it. But what you'll normally do is you'll head to the internet, and you'll read trusted sources. You'll do your research, and you will learn and enrich yourself, and then you can deal with it. And the great thing about that is the next time you see the same thing, you can just deal with it. You, you don't need to do all the research. You don't need to take the risk. You don't need to make, make a mistake. And you become a far more effective manager. Now, if you keep on doing this over a number of years, you're dramatically more effective. Now, in an, if you've got an HR department, every time something crops up, you hand it over to HR. You're never learning that. And what that means is that you're not able to operate as effective in a pace because you've kind of de-skilled yourself or unskilled yourself. And so as we grow this company, what I wanted to do was grow rounded managers, the equivalent of decision-making you know, owners of businesses. So instead of thinking of this as a company of 3,000 people, think of it as, you know, 300 companies of 10 people or, you know, 30 companies of 100 people, in which case the manager should be fully rounded. And, and it's not just HR. You know, in a corporate, you're writing that, I mean, Proxy Yamal, I used to have to write the words that went on the back of a shampoo packet. And I had to get 13 signatures before we were allowed to, you know, have, go to print. And by the way, so you, you work your way through every department, three versions of compliance and regulation, and then some two from legal and European legal, and goodness knows what, in order to have the words, you know, rinse and repeat signed off. And by the way, by the time you've done this, it would take weeks. And, and to probably on the high is these super smart grads, and then they spend so much of their time doing this. Um, and, and, and then at the end of all of that, you decide, actually, we should have put some different words on you know, for marketing reasons, and you go and do it all again. And that's how we spent our jobs. Now, when we had um, uh, you know, a senior marketer join us from actually from a, another energy company, you know, she's brilliant. She's still here now four or five years later. It's been an incredible difference. But she said, the first time she was here, who do I get the um, advertising copy signed off by? I said, well, you're the marketing director. You do it. And she was like, what? And I said, well, look, uh, if there's anything in there that you think is risky enough, you need to get a lawyer to sign it, then probably we shouldn't be saying it. Um, and if you're not sure, then come and have a chat with me. I'll go and have a chat with the legal people. But only do that when you're not sure. The rest of the time, keep on plowing ahead. And I think by having this kind of ability for people to make independent decisions themselves, the business is streamlined. And that's yeah. not about saving overhead. I mean, it's helpful. You know, customers shouldn't have to overpay because companies are inefficient. But it's really about agility because it means we can move faster. And, you know, look, if we're going to disrupt a global sector, a multi-trillion dollar global sector like energy, we need to move fast. So you started in about 2016 and you had just you at the beginning. Then how many employees do you have now and how much growth have you had into your revenues over a billion? Just give some of the numbers to give people context of how this scaled. and it's been successful. Yeah, so today we've got about 3,100 employees across 14 countries. Um, and our revenue is around about, I don't know, $6 billion. You know, were it not for the energy crisis, we'd be growing very rapidly. We're still growing rapidly in a lot of sectors. So we don't just have uh, energy retail now. We've got £4 billion pounds worth, or $6 billion worth of energy generation, uh, wind farms and solar farms. And, and um, I was at an amazing biomass plant yesterday where we take waste um, straw from farms and turn that into enough energy to power 75,000 homes. Uh, we've got a business that leases electric vehicles, um, growing 50% quarter and quarter. Um, it, it's a real powerhouse. And then, uh, of course, our Octopus Energy Group owns Kraken, which is a technology platform. We use that to build our business because we're from a tech background, but we now license it to other companies. Great name, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 again, like, by the way, trusting our team, one of the team came up with it one day and it just stuck. But um, we we now license that to other large companies. There are 25 million accounts licensed to Kraken. Um, and so 
I guess across the group, what we're really doing is saying the energy transition needs this um, fight on many fronts, and it's our job to wherever it's not happening fast enough, we will do it. Like recently, you've mentioned the energy crisis there as well. So obviously, the Russia-Ukraine war has affected the European market, particularly very badly. And you recently made a pledge, which was really interesting, considering a lot of energy companies are struggling. But then you came out there and said you're going to help 50 million for homes. What's behind that decision and how did you, was it a difficult decision or was it something could you just felt this is the right thing? I said earlier about the discipline to do the right thing. Uh, I, I, I read this incredible book that said, um, integrity is what you do when no one's looking, right? Um, it's the choice you make to do the right thing. And I, and I said earlier that, you know, that integrity and discipline as an entrepreneur, I think is key. In our case, in the UK, there's a, a price cap on energy. And uh, in the current energy market, um, every energy company charges the price cap. And, and still, sometimes it's costing us more to buy the energy to meet customers than we charge on the cap. But because of our technology Kraken, our operating cost is about £50, that's $75, I guess, less than the price cap. So we can make the same economics as our rival companies that charge our customers £50 less. And um, we decided to do that. Now, we could have taken the money and put it in our bank account and we'd have been no different than any other company. But we chose in these really hard times to support our customers. And there's an article of faith there. It's the right thing to do. And you hope that in the long run, the fact that you notice it, for example, you know, people notice that a company does that and they recognize the company has character and integrity. And there are going to be times when we need people to stand by us. And I think doing the right thing by them means that they're more likely to do the right thing by us at the right time. As you're looking forward now, with Kraken, with the different parts of the business you're growing, what excites you the most? Which bit is the most exciting thing for you going forwards for Octopus Energy? It's really interesting. A lot of external observers say, wow, you've built this amazing technology platform. You know, it's got, I don't know, 70 or 80% margin. It, it's, you know, I think its revenue is nearly 100 million pounds, 150 million dollars. Um, I mean, that's an incredible power. And they say that you, you should spin that off and enjoy tech company multiples. But actually, for me, that is absolutely integral to our mission of driving the clean energy revolution. Today, around about um, 40% of the UK's energy is renewable. It's 20% in Japan. Other countries typically sit somewhere in between. Sorry, of our electricity is renewable. Um, but electricity is only about 20, 25% of the energy we use. The rest is petrochemicals, uh, oil and gas. And so we've got to move all of the oil and gas onto electricity and all of the electricity onto renewables. This is the single greatest opportunity for business and for humanity, it, it, well, imaginable. And that excites me. What particularly excites me is that we can drive costs for consumers down as we do it because renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. And the holy grail, I think, in business is finding ways to drive costs down for your customers. It's a quote from Jeff Bezos. He says, like, there are companies who work hard to charge customers as much as possible, and there's those who work hard to charge them as little as possible. We'll be the latter. That's our job. Now, that's not to say, like, you know, if you're selling fancy watches, your job is to find ways to charge customers more. That's totally fine. But I think in a sector like energy, I can be incredibly proud that we're doing this thing, that we're taking a a product everyone has to have, we're going to make it cheaper and we're going to stop the damage it does to the planet. I think a lot of people have this trade-off in their mind where they think that by doing the right thing, they're going to have to spend more money. And you're doing the opposite of that, right? Because you don't. Ha- it doesn't have to be more expensive. You think about it, for example, with um, vegan food, for example, where it's often more expensive than if you were to get the junk food. So it's almost charging people more for doing the right thing. And when the economic that shifts where you can pay less and do the right thing. So going with your green energy, it's a very powerful argument there because then it's saving people. It, well, it's two different motivators that aren't in conflict anymore. For a lot of people that might have wanted to do well, good in the past, they wanted, might have wanted to do green energy, but if it was costing them more, then they also had to think about other parts of their lives. So whenever any company can do this kind of thing that you're doing, 
that's where you see that massive growth that you've had. Totally. And, and look, I think it really varies by sector, doesn't it? There are some sectors where people literally want to pay more. So when you're buying fancy wine, people want to spend more because they think they'll get a better product. That's part. But there are sectors where we don't want them to pay more. We want, you know, look, the energy can contribute to a dramatic change in society. Like the, the energy revolution going from uh, fossil fuels to renewables is not a like for like swap. It's the opportunity to create whole new industries. Um, for example, uh, one thing we've discovered here in the UK is some of our customers run vertical farms. That's indoor farms, old warehouse, fitted out with incredible technology, and they grow crops inside. The single biggest cost is energy. And um, you know, if we can give them cheap renewable energy, they can grow crops more economically viably. And that means crops don't have to be shipped hundreds or thousands of miles in planes and diesel trucks, but they've been grown where you eat them. So it's, and it, it doesn't just improve the energy, it improves everything. But um, you know, when, when we look at these vertical farms, they're also, by the way, they don't need any pesticides because they're sealed environments. 99% of the water that goes into the building leaves the building in the fruit and veg. All the rest is recycled. So they're just better. And the key to this is that um, they get cheap energy now when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing and we've got a lot of renewables available. And the plants are totally happy to grow on a different schedule based around energy pricing. And that is how one sector is transforming. It, it's like the way in which the iPhone transformed the cab industry. No one saw the iPhone was going to create Uber. But it's enabled people around the world to get cheaper access to better uh, transportation. Yeah. Clean energy is going to do the same in so many sectors. I really like the idea that you said there about energy is a foundation for so many other businesses. Because we see it, right? With inflation right now in the UK, part of it is because of energy cr- prices increasing. So then that increases delivery costs. It increases everything across the board. But when you can do the opposite effect of that, where you can make it cheaper for people to do create their businesses, then it speeds up innovation across the board. Because even if you look at other tech companies, they all need electricity at some like at some part in their totally like, supply chain, right? You can't. None of this tech can work without energy. Take an example, right? Take crypto mining. Everyone knows it uses vast amounts of electricity, and some people worry it's going to be bad for the planet. Now, the reality is there are, there are wind farms where sometimes when it's windy, they literally can't find a customer for the electricity. Now, if you put a crypto farm connected to a wind turbine, um, you can use that electricity that would otherwise literally be wasted for crypto mining without doing any damage to the planet whatsoever at all. And not only that, you know, you can be bypassing the grid, so you're not using a, another precious resource. Um, now, I'm not saying that that means crypto mining is entirely conscience-free, but it's an example of thinking about things in a, in a new world that didn't exist in the old one. I, I wonder if any of our listeners today are going to take that idea there and uh, hook up a mining machine to a, a wind turbine. You might have made somebody very rich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But honestly, it's like the cheapest power that's available. You know, it, it's 100% renewable. Seems like not a bad idea. And time doesn't matter. It, when it's not blowing, you just don't do any mining. When the wind's blowing, you're doing mining. I mean, it's not like watching telly where you have to be able to do it even when it's not windy. Yeah, it's true, right? And like, it's amazing where you've got to now and how you're changing so many different sectors. But obviously, along the way, there must have been some hard lessons you learned that enabled you to make the decisions you're making now. What were some of those big mistakes you made that got you where you are? I, the first thing is, look, I honestly don't dwell on mistakes. Um, I... I I say to people, like, look, regret is one of the worst human emotions because you can't change the past. You can change the future, right? So it's always thinking about we can, we can, it doesn't matter what's happened, we've got to think about what we're going to do going forward. That's number one. Number two is, um, like, blame is terrible because it makes people feel shit and they stop, they stop feeling confident in doing stuff. So we've got to be really careful on that. Um, when it comes to mistakes, I think, of course, we're stupid if we don't learn from them. And so it's stupid not to learn from a mistake. But we've got to take the right lesson. You know, so if you, if you fall off a bike, the right lesson is never is not don't get on a bike. It's, you know, when you're riding, be careful of gravel or whatever. But I think very often people take the wrong So I just really try hard not to obsess on mistakes. Um, the biggest mistake, and that's the other thing, is like a lot of mistakes are ones that are not obvious. 
So what was the biggest mistake in this business? I'll tell you what it was. It was that we wrote the business plan in 2011, and it said we needed, I don't know, $15 million of, of seed funding. And we never worked in energy. We were moderately successful tech entrepreneurs, but um, I didn't have the confidence to go out and try and raise $15 million without even an MVP. And in a regulated sector, you can't build an MVP. So we just didn't do it. And we wasted four years um, that we could have been making incredible progress because I hadn't had the confidence to go and raise the money. And we only raised the money because I happened to be introduced to an investor who invested, who runs an investment firm, Simon Rogers of Octopus Investments. Uh, they invest in VC stuff and they invest in green energy. And when I met him, I was like, oh, that idea, he might be the right guy. That was four years later. And so, you know, if we've grown exponentially, where would we be now if we'd started four years earlier? So there you go. The biggest mistake was not having the confidence to do something. And it's not, I think when we think about mistakes, we're always thinking about things we did do that went wrong. I think it's half the time it's ones like that. And you mentioned that this earlier as well about how lots of people want to be entrepreneurs, just don't go out and do it because that's what, what's the worst that can happen? It can fail. Yeah. Then you can start something totally. new, you can do something else. But if you don't yeah. try, and I know a few people like this, some of my friends who've got business plans that they show me or things like this, and they're just not pulling the trigger. And you can plan all you want, but then when reality hits you, yeah. you're going to need to adapt anyway. Yeah. So this is one of my favorite topics, right? So I talk about entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs, right? And it's totally cool. We shouldn't fetishize entrepreneurialism. It's a, it's a disease, right? I mean, thanks for entrepreneurialism uh, you know, and the drive that I have to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I've got a trail of broken relationships. I've got friendships I haven't kept up. Uh, I'm probably not as healthy as I should be, but it's just what drives me. I'm, I'm a born entrepreneur, right? but, but you know, there are people out there who think they should be one. They think, and, and it's not for everyone. You know, the risks are not right for everyone, but we, what, what, what people should do is make that decision about whether they're going to do it or not. And you can always come back to it later in life. But I, a great example for me was a friend who, um, exactly as you described, they had his business plan. And every, we go out for curry every few months. And every time he we went out for curry, he was like a few months away from starting his business. He was like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and start this once I've got a couple of client relationships. And then we go back and, he, and he'd say, we got the next curry. You go, so you got a client relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to start it once I've sorted out some stuff. Anyway, and it was just always, and I just said to him, look, um, you keep on saying you're going to do it when something's ready. And each time that's ready, there's got to be something else. You're just never going to do it. Be honest with yourself or just do it. Anyway, next time we went out for curry, he said, I did it. Uh, I left the company. I've set up. It's going brilliantly. I've never been happier. Now, you know, I was a bit nervous when he said he'd done it because I was like, I hope it's working out. Anyway, it was working out. That was years ago. He's now unbelievably successful. And it only happened because he just bit the bullet. He got to bite the bullet. Like you said there, I think for some people, they worry about what other people have done. So they say, oh, mm. for example, with me, like I left my job and doing what I'm doing now and it's going pretty well so far. And people are saying, oh, I wish I could do that. But it's like, if you're happy in what you're doing, then do that. Like it's, there's no yeah. fundamental problem with having a nine to five. And obviously you hire so many people mm. who've got a nine to five and they're happy because yeah. it's more about the environment you're in. And if you don't Seriously. want to take any risks, because there is a, there is a very scary, right? As you said, and that's a lot of stress. There's a lot of anxiety that comes with that. And it's not for everybody. No. no. It's like being in football. Some people are goalkeepers. Some are strikers. Some choose to be a manager. They're all great, right? Yeah. The team needs all of them. And society yeah. needs all these different things. Yeah. There's you a couple of other things. Like, oh, no, exactly, right? And, and you know, which is the most glorious? doesn't matter. I, I think what, what then goes on to say is... Um, uh, I'll say it doesn't matter what other people think, right? And I think whether, by the way, it applies to an entrepreneur or not, but people worry about how am I going to be judged if it fails, right? Who cares? You're in control of your destiny. The only opinions that really matter are yours. If you care about any others, it'll be one or two people close to you. But frankly, they should just care for your well-being. Anyone, you know, but that fear of judgment holds us back. And one of the things I find fascinating is when you speak to grannies, Grannies are typically quite happy people. 
because they've stopped worrying about how others judge them. You know, people are always surprised if they come out as gay or whatever, and their grannies, granny's always the best. They're always, oh, it's amazing. Right? And they were scared that, you know, someone of that generation might not be so welcoming, but they're always welcoming because they've seen it all, they've been there, they don't worry. They're just cool. And I think one of the crying shames in life is we don't learn to be as cool as a granny when we're very young. That's number one. I think number two on that fear of being judged and fear of failure is that there's a company that um, uh, I helped start that's just sold for I don't know, $65 million, builds health tech. By the way, it serves half of the patients in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. It transforms their lives. It's made, it, it dramatically improves our access to the best medicine whilst cutting the cost for the health service. It's a win win, a bit like we talked about with but the guys who started that, I think it's their fourth business in a row in healthcare. Two of them failed. I mean, they, they closed them down and moved on. Um, and one of them was moderately successful and provided the kind of impetus for this. So you've got some failures, some success. What really mattered was, again, they were decisive and they just got on with it and they didn't worry about being judged. And in return, they've transformed tens of thousands of, of, of lives or healthcare experiences and they've made a really successful business. And they've saved money for the health service. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think in the content industry as well, it's a similar thing of people don't want to make their first video or write the first article. And I always say to people, is that if it doesn't do well, then by definition, nobody's read it, nobody's seen it. So nobody even knows you failed. So you can't possibly lose. And it's even the same with businesses, is that if you fail, then nobody ever hears your business. So it's fine. It's if you've reached the stage where you've grown so big that it's in the national newspapers, then you must have done something pretty good along that way to get to that kind of scale to get that coverage in the first place. And there's lessons you can take from that. You can then build that further, as you said, where first company might fail, second company might fail, maybe the tenth company fails. But eventually, if you're learning as you go along, something will come right. right. And what really matters is what you think of yourself. As long as you can always tell yourself you did your best and what you did was right, yeah, you've got a good chance of looking after yourself. What your so beyond Octopus Energy? What's your other ambitions in terms of your own career now? Is there with the, like not having a HR department? Is there any other different things you want to test out or ideas that you think you could make your business better in terms of the internal atmosphere? Yeah, so I think the first thing is uh, there's a great song by Kenny Rogers. Um, uh, sadly, uh, uh, died recently, but um, which was. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. There'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. And that's not about money. It's about you know, success or any other way that you measure yourself. And so I think for us, um, one of the most important things is, is, is recognizing we are not successful. We've had a number of successes. We've achieved things. We should be incredibly proud of that. But we've only got a 0.4% global market share. So despite the fact our revenue is... Yeah, you know, six billion dollars or something. We're still tiny relative to the opportunity. Um, that you know, the global energy system is still emitting inordinate amounts of carbon into the air. So we haven't been massively successful in changing that yet. Um, and that outside of the UK, our business in most countries, and we want to be global, is small. So we've got an enormous amount of way to go. So we should be incredibly proud of what we've done. But, you know, we are still in the foothills of the Himalayas and we've got to work incredibly hard to climb the mountains. I've loved talking to you today. Where can people hear more about you and about Octopus Energy if they want to find out more? You know what? I'm a bit embarrassed to say it, but the Octopus Energy podcast is um, genuinely worth listening to, especially on this, these kind of topics, episode zero and one. Um, you, you remember the Netflix culture deck that kind of went viral in the entrepreneur community and business community? Quite rightly so. And we were like, quite a lot of it reflected our culture. And we thought, well, we'll, let's start with theirs and we'll work out what will codify our culture so that people who are joining the company or thinking of joining it or are interested in it can find out more. Um, but we found that the act of writing it down actually caused us, we spent ages on wordsmithing. It was, and we realized the real thing we could do was just talk about it naturally. So we set up a podcast. And that podcast is real insights into everything about how we think about the company we're building and our relationship with customers, society, and each other. 
So Octopus Energy Podcast, I think it's called Inside Octopus. 